um, to come up for the panel. And um, this is really meant to be interactive. So if um, we, I think we have the teens back in here, if you've got a question you'd actually like to ask of other teens, that's fine. Parents of another parent, that's fine too. Um, one request we do have though is to try not to really get into your child's um, personal personal issues with the doctor. They're more than happy to talk to you on one on one, but this is meant to be kind of a group discussion, not um, a doctor's appointment. So if you can just keep that in mind, we'll get everybody back up here and get started. Come on down. In the meantime, I'm just going to just make sure that anybody with a child with systemic scleroderma has stopped at the Make-A-Wish table. Make-A-Wish, uh, what I learned a year ago is Make-A-Wish is more than just um, for cancer patients. And it, it's not for end of life patients. It's for people with severe disease. Um, they are out there. They want to make your child's wish come true, so make sure you stop by and say hello and, and uh, talk to them if you have something special that you would like for your child. Pharmacy questions, gotta have you. <laughs> Who else? Claudette is coming, okay. All right, we got lots of microphones. Yeah. <laughs> we could start without without them. Look at this. See, all right. <laughs> I'm going to bring you a microphone just so everybody can hear what you. I know, I know. Should I should I just hold it in my hand so I can grab it? No. No, no. Okay. Do I just start? Okay. Um, I kind of had a drug-related question. Um, my daughter has systemic scleroderma. She's been on methotrexate for three years. Uh, injections most of the time. Um, pills didn't do a whole lot. She's been on Celsept for the past month and a half. Doc's basically just like, we don't really know. We're just going to throw stuff at her, see if it works. Um, she's like, you're going to feel like you're in a clinical trial. And then she wants to talk um, in maybe three months um, Actemra, another biologic. I know you guys were talking about that being moved from infusions to now um, injections, so it's more readily available for this kind of treatment. But she's also on a lot of medications for the GI issues, right? So lansoprazole, uh, other things. Is there reduced efficacy of oral medications like the Celsep that she's on with combinations of taking lansoprazole? Obviously, logically tells you yes, correct? Why is that not addressed? Um, uh, she's, I spoke to her rheumatologist about it and I said, okay, um, this is a concern. CVS actually called me and said, hey, this is a concern. She's on these meds. We want to address and make sure she's on the right dosage. She's uh, symptomatic, not at the highest tapered dose they want her at, so we're just staying here. What is the point of being on this medication if we're not even at the highest dose she wants? She's still symptomatic and sick from it. Is it actually going to be effective with the medication she's on? Is that complicated? That was really wordy. I apologize. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so as far as the lansoprazole is concerned, and you know, from a pharmacist standpoint, I will tell you most of the time I will say that we recommend that separated as far as possible from other medications to decrease the likelihood of any other interactions. So a lot of the other medications, uh, I'd have to go through each one independently, but really what it comes down to is some of them are acid dependent um, in order to be broken down appropriately. And so keeping that lansoprazole as far apart as possible. So usually I try to do it as early in the morning as possible, even if it's you know uh, earlier than they actually would wake up. And then that gives them a little bit of time to actually uh, metabolize that drug before you introduce another drug. Twice a day dosing? So she's on lansoprazole and then she's on Zantac twice a day as well. Um, okay, so yeah. oftentimes the Zantac, um, it, so the Zantac is, is uh, for histamine receptors. Those are a little more resilient 
when okay. it comes to it. And the, the proton pump inhibitors are the ones that actually are more potent when it comes to the acid base balance in the stomach. And so I would be more concerned about the proton pump inhibitor than I would be the other two. So, but, but at least an hour. How do you dose that? You've got a medications, your kid goes to school, tries to go to school. You know what I'm saying? So realistically, like you said, you're going to wake your child up, give her the lansoprazole, go back to bed. Then I'm going to wake you up. We're going to do some of your other meds. And then uh, as soon as you get home, you're going to take these meds. And then you, you literally just spread them out as much as you can and hope for. From a pharmacist standpoint, yes. Okay. Um, and, and yes, it, it does become very tedious over time. Um, I mean, I, I could work with you a little bit more as far as exactly what medications at what times and what can be combined together. Um, because that that's challenging all in itself, mm -hmm. uh, and it really depends on what medications there are. So, uh, you know, in in the world of outpatient pharmacy and the way that that works is we're just trying to increase adherence and really make it feasible and reasonable. And so, ultimately speaking, um, if there's if there's more than four or five times a day, we know that the compliance decreases. Yeah, I mean, it's just hard to do naturally. Um, so if, if you want, I think you guys have my email address, just let me know and I can kind of break down each one of those for you and see if we can come up with a better regimen. But even then you can't guarantee effectiveness of the drug because so, you are taking something yeah. that's reducing it, right? Just address that. Um, that piece of it, titrating up medicine, what is the right dose? What is the right dose for your dog? What is the right dose for your dog? That's decision that we need to talk about. And we're going to get there maybe 10 years. It's going to be the microbiome plus the whole genome sequence plus your RNA sequences and your cellular thing. And we'll put it all in a computer and they'll tell us what to do. For now, we're stuck with this. That's real cool. Giving up the medicine, giving the medicine, <laughs> giving as much as we can until there's side effects and then backing off. Did it work? If not, we move to the next medicine. What's promising is that it's not just throw stuff at her. Now we have really good data that mycophenolate is great for systemic sclerosis. It works really well on a lot of people. Now we're making really educated guesses. Um, and we have a much greater chance of success with, with the data that we have now. Thank you. The only other thing I would add, and I feel like the, probably like the black helicopters of pharmacokinetics are going to shoot me down for saying this out loud. But when it comes to, especially meds like cellception, or kids who are on cellception steroids, you know, this one's supposed to be before meals, and this one's supposed to be with meals. At the end of the day, taking something is more effective than not taking course, it. And so rather than driving your girl absolutely crazy, waking your child up early, putting her back to sleep, do it. It's like, what works for you to get these medications in, in a reasonable schedule that does not destroy your entire quality of life, right. and go with that. Because yeah, okay, maybe this one is best timed that way in a textbook, but life is not and why, even with a completely healthy child getting ready in the morning to go to school, yeah, well, is a disaster. <laughs> so if you add in like three million different drugs that all have to be timed differently with food and take out one quick cracker and pull the like you just you do what you can and you see what results you get. And if it doesn't work, you try something else. And I'd also say that you know you shouldn't necessarily focus on trying to reach the maximum dose because people respond at different levels. So your child might not need the maximum dose to get the maximum effect, right? Okay. So this is, there's a range of medicines. People metabolize things differently. It's hands that just getting towards precision medicine, right? So so that's a target, but some people, you know, need much less medicine. Some people need more. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> How many so, years of medical school does it take to work a microphone? Yeah. <laughs> oh. It takes more than the AV, but. Uh. <laughs> You're out now. Okay. Um, so, it, and, and that is absolutely true as far as you, know, you, can, you can maximize it the best that you can, but ultimately everybody's body is going to be different. And then there's also genetic testing and things like that where each drug works differently based on genetics. Um, so there's a lot being done right now when it comes to what is the right dose, because I'll, I'll tell you, there are a lot of uh, CYP enzyme type um, errors of metabolism that, you know, that dose for that patient uh, may be half the dose based on whatever their genes are. And so that plays in a lot here too. And so the only drug I'm really concerned about is that proton pump inhibitor. You know, on the other ones, you just do it based on, you know, how, how it's working, and then you titrate as needed. Thank you. Yes, go ahead. Um, so at uh, eight, my daughter was diagnosed with vitiligo, and then at 13, she was diagnosed with uh, localized scleroderma. 
how wary do we need? I mean, uh, obviously her autoimmune system is messed up. How wary do we need to be of any further autoimmune diseases appearing? I mean, is that something to be concerned about? Stump the panel. Come on, um, guys. There I, we go. I mean, so <laughs> vitiligo is relatively common in the dermatology world. You know, psoriasis is, you know, 1%, 2% of the population. I, I think vitiligo could be close to there also. So, um, yes, it is an autoimmune disease. Localized scleroderma is much rarer, and more autoimmune diseases are associated with localized scleroderma. So, you know, thyroid problems um, can also occur diabetes, but these are all very uncommon. So basically, if your child is getting, you know, regular checkups, they would be monitoring for, you know, her growth, her sugars, and the routine lab tests. So I don't think you need to drive yourself crazy. You have enough things to drive yourself crazy, so you really don't have to worry. You know, I think the big fear has always been that localized is going to evolve into systemic sclerosis, and the data really is not supportive of that. What happens in some people is they get both disease, but systemic sclerosis patients can get localized scleroderma lesions afterwards, and localized scleroderma can sometimes develop systemic sclerosis. So in terms of the Ray nodes, you know, that doesn't, with localized, it doesn't usually evolve into systemic sclerosis either. Can you hear? Um, so w our daughter has uh, the MTHFR factor, so we're talking about the methotrexate and trying to figure out the optimum dose. Um, What's your opinion on, I mean, you know, she's on a lower than optimal dose now, but how do you know, you, you mentioned the CYP like pathways, how do you know, I mean, we're not going to destroy your liver by, and is it effective if it's half of what it should be, the methotrexate dose? far as from a grand scheme of things, you're looking at a different dose. So really, you're just looking at the effective dose. Um, and then monitoring for liver function and kidney function and so on and so forth. And that's the best that we can do with what we have. Um, because there, uh, I don't know if you all know anything else about MTHFR, if you all want to throw it in here. <laughs> Um, and so, you know, it, there, there's a lot out there as far as, you know, other potential vitamins. And when the, with the MTHFR, you just want to make sure, you know, the folic acid is being monitored. Yeah, right. um, and that's going to be the biggest issue is just making sure that, that you're keeping an eye on that. That was one question. Um, oh, for the folic acid or folate, are you supposed to take it every single day or are you supposed to not take it on the injection day? I mean, I think there probably is variability in practice. I typically do it every day. And to be honest, in some patients, if they have a lot of nausea, we actually have them double it the days like before of and after okay. the methotrexate. Um, other providers sometimes decrease it on the day. I mean, it, I think there's variability amongst providers. So it's not going to hurt to take it the day. It's not going to reduce the effectiveness. Our daughter, if we miss one day, she gets mouth sores. So Yeah, I, I think that comes from the adult rheumatoid arthritis literature, oh, okay. where they suggested that maybe the efficacy was a little lower if you took folate acid or high doses of it right around the time of it. But that doesn't really tell you anything about how effective it's going to be for scleroderma. And it also um, you know, addresses this if, if your daughter has ulcers every week and her quality of life is so bad because of the methotrexate, then maybe that's not the right medicine. Mm -hmm. you know? So it's that balancing act of you try everything you can to be able to tolerate it. Kind of if just it's not tolerated, you have to try something else. Yeah, we kind of doubled the folate and the mouth sores went away, but got to take it every day. Uh, one more question, then I'll be done. Um, as far as pre and probiotics, are either or both recommended or not? Okay, I'm done now. <laughs> yeah, I don't think we have any evidence around prebiotics or probiotics in scleroderma. Okay. Hi, I have a few questions. So um, I would like to know with the physicians, you guys in your practice, how does the ANA and the AHA uh, do you do draws on your patients for that, you know, do those testings um, when you're treating juvenile linear scleroderma? 
Um, I'm usually um, drawing those labs as initial screen. You know, we were trying to evaluate does this child seem to have that, you know. Um, the AHA, that's, um, so the ANA is found in about half of the children. In some studies, it's about 30%. So when I find it, I just tend to assume that this child may have a little bit more of a systemic, you know, maybe a little bit more at risk for extracutaneous involvement. So it's just sort of like a, maybe a little marker for that. Um, in terms of the AHA, that's just one of the autoantibodies. Uh, studies have been mixed as to its significance. If I find a patient that has a very high level, I will tend to follow it periodically because I just feel that the less autoantibody signal you have, that's indicating that the disease is getting better. So it's just, we have very little, we have like no biomarkers, right? So anything that I could potentially track that's associated with the disease activity, I'll try to follow, but. Okay, and then I guess my last question is, I'm, I'm confused and um, maybe I heard you wrong, but did you say that it's possible for, to have localized turn Systemic? No. What'd you say? What I said is that some patients will have both diseases. Okay. Both Just diseases. Like, right. So some patients will have lupus and rheumatoid arthritis. Some Correct. patients will have psoriasis and lupus. So all of our diseases can be mixed. So this is true for localized and systemic also, that some patients can have both of those diseases. But that does not mean that one is evolving into the other, because there are systemic sclerosis patients that develop localized scleroderma after they have systemic sclerosis. But it could explain why somebody with localized juvenile linear scleroderma has Raynaud's and has positive well, ANA. Raynaud's is found in is in found in two to seven percent of patients with localized scleroderma. It seems to be higher in adults, which is probably partly related to the frequency of Raynaud's is higher in adults, okay? But what would be concerning about a patient with localized scleroderma that has Raynaud's is if they get digital ulcers, pits, those would be more serious signs, okay? But the frequency of Raynaud's also rises in childhood, so adolescents have it more frequently than younger kids, okay? So, so again, you know, you're talking about a problem that could coexist could exist by itself, and then you have another condition, right? Okay, so it doesn't necessarily mean that that means a child is going to evolve, okay? And if we have a rheumatologist that doesn't believe in ANA or AHA, is that okay? That doesn't believe in using it for any purpose? I don't think it's been shown to have a definite role, okay? So if they don't want to do it, you know, I think they may just be trying to save you some money, okay? Thank so. <laughs> okay, coming over. Good afternoon. I've been hearing a lot about stem cell um, transplant, and um, that is something that I, I just recently found out by reading the internet. And um, I would like to know um, how does that work with scleroderma, and if actually it can be done, um, what, are the, what are the possibilities of a a child with scleroderma to have it done in, I mean, how does it work if it, if it is something that really ha is happening? So I can address that. The, um, the stem cell transplant, it's a hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, which used to be a bone marrow transplantation, but now what happens is the, um, the immune system is stimulated by a medicine to produce a lot of stem cells in the blood, and then you can take them out of the blood wash them up, and then um, and give them back to the patient after the patient's immune system has been um, basically eliminated with chemotherapy. The reason why we think this might work in systemic sclerosis, it's not for localized, it's only for the systemic sclerosis patients, is that we know that the immune system has taken a wrong turn. It's autoimmunity. It was supposed to learn to distinguish between yourself and foreign invaders, and it, it didn't learn right, so we give it a fresh start. We just wipe out the immune system and let the new cells that are coming out of the bone marrow now, and then these replaced stem cells, let them um, learn, hope that they learn better this time. And the reason why there's a ton of excitement this year is that there's a um, five-year study in adult patients that was published in um, January that they, where they compared patients um, on chemotherapy, cytoxan, to patients that had stem cell transplant. And these were patients with systemic sclerosis with pretty severe lung disease. 
and they found that the patients after the stem cell transplant um, did much better. Their skin was better and their lungs were better at the end of a few uh, five years. So um, now there are several centers that have, have years and years of expertise in stem cell transplants. So it, whereas it used to be very dangerous, now it's much, much safer. Um, and um, the, the original protocols that they used that were for like leukemia had to be adapted for scleroderma. They can't use the same protocols. So now we know how to do that a lot better. Um, and there, um, so it is a potential treatment for very severe systemic sclerosis. And our hope is that this resetting of the immune system with your own, so they're autologous, it's your own, uh, it's your own um, stem cells, not someone else's stem cells, that these will be reset and then they will learn not to attack um, the blood vessels and the skin of the, of the child's body. There are several places that are doing this that are open to, um, to children, enrolling children. One is in Seattle, the Fred Hutch Cancer Research Center. One is in Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh has a very long, strong history of transplantation. Um, and then in Canada, Toronto and Calgary, I know, are also doing um, do it. And they have a high level of expertise. So I think, again, it's not for everybody, but um, um, any of these four places are happy to evaluate kids um, and discuss what it would take. And then the only thing I have to say to that, only because I'm on all of those, stem, the Facebook stem cell transplant blogs and so on and so forth, to be really cautious and to go to those centers because there are a lot of people who advertise that they do that and there's a lot of people going to centers because they were um, rejected from these mm -hmm. and there's a lot of risks associated with that. So that's my only kind yeah, of Yeah, there's, it's such a um, vigorous protocol in following and um, looking for, for side effects and troubles and, and counteracting them. I mean, in Seattle, you have to come and, and um, commit to staying in Seattle for 100 days so that they can, you can be watched that carefully. Um, and that takes a team approach that does this every single day, very routine um, team approach. So I totally second that. Is it the same providers doing adults as it is the kids or teens? Um, Do you know? Like I, Columbia does? There stem are cell? adults. and the, So in our center, I know there's a pediatric oncologist and an adult onco uh, oncologist who are part of this team who have been doing all of the adult systemic sclerosis um, transplants. And that team of adult and pediatric are doing the children too oh, as well. Nice. Any last minute questions here? Anybody want more? I just wanted to know the relationship or have you um, dealt with a child that has scleroderma or linear scleroderma and then lupus? Um, or that, that's all been, the you know, signs um, of lupus? Again, these uh, connective tissue diseases, they can coexist. So patients can start off with one diagnosis, develop another. Some patients are sort of what we call undifferentiated, that they have features that could be in this one and this one and this one, and it's not clear enough to to define that. And I, I know, you know your family has a strong history of of lupus, so this is likely contributing if, yeah. you know, if, if uh, your child might be developing both diseases. Right, that, that's, yeah, because she didn't have these symptoms and now they're like overwhelming now with all the symptoms of. So just, just from a patient's story, you know, as, as far as, you know, initially the picture for me was scleroderma and I had the antibodies for that and then you know, the other half of life has been lupus. And so, um, I mean, personally, and I don't know what your guys' experience has been because you guys have a lot more patients behind you uh, as a case study of one. Uh, but um, it, I, for me personally, I have felt that that could have been what has actually decreased the si or the symptoms of both okay. as far as, you know, and that could be why I didn't have the skin involvement. I don't know. I don't know what your guys' involvements are with mixed connective, but I ended up with the diagnosis now of mixed connective, and that's just kind of where they, sta they stand. Okay. So yeah. It kind of evolves. So, so okay. again, we, we have limits in how well we can, you know, identify and diagnose these diseases. We really have crude. You know, we'd love to have the biomarkers where we could more clearly say, oh, yeah, clearly this patient has an overlap or they have a mixed connective tissue disease or they seem to be more purely in the typical localized scleroderma or typically in the loop. But... You know, symptoms are going to, lupus patients can have Raynaud's, lupus patients, you know, can have localized scleroderma-like lesions. So mm -hmm. there is a, 
you know, shared pathology among these different diseases. So sometimes one, um, one some problems may become more manifest, you know, so it's right. not like it's this one or it's that one. Right, Even because I was asking because we were told like her numbers don't quite, her labs, her numbers don't quite show it, but actually it could be. Yeah, according so to according to the numbers, it doesn't look like it, but it actually could possibly very well be this because maybe if she's one point off, it doesn't it doesn't that would say oh she doesn't have it, but in just say in African Americans the numbers may very well be off anyways because of her predisposed you know, because of her DNA, because of her genetics. Right. So I don't, you know, so that- So she may just always stay in this sort of limbo area where she seems like she's a little bit like that, but she's not gonna fully evolve. There are a number of patients that stay like that, okay. okay so the only other last thing to add is that, you know, the, at the end of the day, the point of a diagnosis, while it's reassuring to like have an answer, the, the two biggest reasons for a diagnosis are to direct our treatment and to help predict the future. And if we see those autoimmune features, the reassuring news is the same treatment approach regardless of the specific label is like, you know, there, I mean, there are some manifestations that respond better to some meds than another, but in large part, the treatment approach would be the same. And when you have enough autoimmune features, which it sounds like she would in terms of the prediction of the future, my suspicion is she's probably being followed closely and monitored for progression. So while it's reassuring to have a label just to kind of emotionally to say, this is it, from a practical standpoint, the management probably wouldn't be that so much So the different. medicines are really all shared across, right? So these biological medicines we're talking about, they're all used for rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, right? So we just say, oh, this patient has some more joint issues or skin issues that suggest that maybe they're going to respond because maybe it's a similar path pathophysiology process. So. Okay, let's have a round of applause for our panel. Thank you for participating. <laughs> All right. I think the kids are going to be coming back in this room for the closing. Um, so we'll open up those doors and let everybody in, then we'll start. I hear there's a couple birthdays in the house. Sarah and Jesse? Sarah and Jesse here yet? Okay. And who else? What's her name? Brianna has a birthday too? Wow, all right, let me write that down. Is it today? Is Brianna's birthday today? Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> There's still a lot of gifts outside, so before you leave, make sure, because a lot of families won more than one present. So there's still things out there. And remember to do your evaluations too. Um, before we close up, we have one more speaker that I'd like to introduce. A few years ago, uh, a family in on Long Island, I'm from New York, uh, so they are well, it's a huge state. They're not really close next door, but they're in the same state as I am um, from Long Island. Um, wanted to get involved with the Scleroderma Foundation, and they had this dream of having events that raised significant amounts of money, uh, and they formed a 501c3 called A Lasting Mark. And the um, person that oversees uh, what goes on in that uh, foundation is Luke Mendola, who is our closing speaker for today. Um, so they've been doing wonderful things. They've raised over $200,000 since they started the foundation. So woohoo, you guys, that's awesome news. And they want to keep going. They want to raise more money. So we're just very glad that they all came in from uh, Long Island to be here today. And Mr. Luke Medulla was diagnosed with linear scleroderma in 2013. So that's about the, the time that we became acquainted with the family. Luke is driven in his journey with scleroderma. He wants to create a positive change in the lives of children who are also affected by this disease. So in 2013, Luke and his family established that foundation, A Lasting Mark, 
uh, you'll see it, the initials as LAM, raising the, uh, the amazing amount of $200,000. And I think it was the first $100,000 was a gift that went to the Hospital for Special Surgery in uh, New York City. Uh, Luke hopes that the funds from this charity will increase awareness, educate others, and support research to improve the quality of life for others affected by the disease. Luke is excited to be pursuing a degree at this point. He's graduated from um, high school. He's in college, uh, Jericho High School, and he is um, looking into pursuing a degree in psychology as well as to help this foundation grow. His overall goal is to help children overcome disabilities. So I am very pleased to introduce to you Luke Madolo as our closing speaker. There you go, Luke. Are you comfortable with the handheld? Yeah. Okay. Mic check, mic check. <laughs> all right, all right. So, hello, everyone. Uh, I hope you are all enjoying this conference as much as I am. This is uh, my third time being at a scleroderma conference. And this experience has been a lot different than my first one, to say the least, OK? Um, so the first time I went to LS conference, I was 13 years old. So as you can imagine, being a typical teenager, I had no desire being there, OK? I thought it was another chore on the to-do list because of my condition, and well, it was in New Jersey, so you know, New Jersey, Colorado, you know, you compare the two, but uh, um, so although I will say this, um, part of me was curious um, to see if there was any other kid on the planet like me, you know, because I was convinced like I was a special breed and. There, there couldn't be anyone going through similar circumstances I was going through. Like, I was convinced. And so, although when I was at the conference, I was really shocked and surprised to see how many other kids were also affected by scleroderma. And it was really eye-opening to see that, you know, I'm not alone in this fight, and there are a ton of other kids across the states and going through similar challenges we all go through. So part of that was really reassuring to know that I'm not alone in this fight. Um, so at the conference, uh, ironically, uh, for a stress relief method, they wanted the group doing uh, yoga. And so unfortunately for me, I have a harder time doing yoga because I have a harder time um, like putting weight on my hand so I was like, I don't know if this is for me for stress relief, you know? And, you know, I, I did notice they had a yoga activity today, which is funny. Uh, I didn't participate. Uh, but, um, not to knock the conference, but just, you know, everyone's different in what they like to do for stress. So I, I'm not a fan of yoga. And, but, uh, so I was the only kid who couldn't do yoga in the group. So this was the place where I was finally supposed to feel like everyone else, yet I was still the only kid who was, you know, who couldn't do the yoga. So I was like, ah, what is this? And so well, then after that, I remember my parents introducing me to this woman who also had linear scleroderma in her hand. And she was the first person I ever met with this condition. And she was, uh, she was older than me, and she had a lot of progress through her occupational therapy. So to say the least, she was doing a lot, of, a lot of better job in terms of therapy, splinting, you know. Being a typical teenager, I was constantly fighting with my uh, parents about wearing the splint to school. I didn't want to draw any more attention to myself than, you know, I was already dealing with. Um, so I remember her telling me that by playing the drum, she was able to keep her hand in good form. So this was really encouraging to see that, you know, other people who are undergoing the same uh, circumstances were still, you know, working hard to make it better for themselves. And so I felt more determined 
in my occupational therapy because I knew there are more people out there undergoing similar problems. Um, I'm not afraid to admit that uh, some people do handle it better than me. I'm not perfect, obviously. Um, like, uh, I, like to, I like to look up to people because, uh, who have it harder than me because they're the true heroes in my eyes, such as uh, NFL player Shaquem Griffin. For those of you who don't know, Shaquem Griffin is a NFL player uh, who was drafted by the Seattle Seahawks this past year, and he has one hand. He was drafted in the third round. For those of you who don't know, Tom Brady was drafted in the sixth round. So, uh, dear Shaquem Griffin, stop making me look bad, all right? Um, I thought to myself, you know, well, why can't I work as hard as Shaquem Griffin, you know? He's doing unbelievable things in the league against all odds. And that is just really inspiring. So, I thought it would be a cool idea to find superstars like me and hope to inspire them to realize just how capable they are dis despite being dealt with this condition. I still, um, I still don't think it should affect our dreams and goals. I, th I firmly be uh, believe in, you know, take your, experiencing, take your experiences of having this autoimmune and try to turn it into positive. Okay, um, that's really important to me because you know that your level of acceptance will change. Um, I will definitely say my uh, stage of acceptance is definitely not where it was when I was 14. You know, five years is a lot of time and a lot of experience gained, and so I've matured in a way to accept linear scleroderma for what it is, and I'm okay with it. Um, being diagnosed was unquestionably out of my control, but what's for certain is there are many variables outside of having LS that I still have a complete grip on. By gaining a tremendous amount of experience and perspective on life with linear scleroderma, it has matured me and a way to know that I'm grateful for all the ordinary things the common man fails to recognize. For those of you who don't understand what I'm talking about, for instance, the firm right handshake. When's the last time you shook hands with someone and were like, wow, I'm really grateful for that handshake? I'm guessing never unless you were shaking hands with like Ariana Grande. You know what I mean? <laughs> uh, Yet, one of my dreams when I was 13 was always just to have that proper right handshake, you know? Whenever uh, meeting new people, it's always the right handshake. So I was always uh, hesitant and dealing with my insecurity of extending with my right hand. That was one of the early challenges I soon faced. Um, see, like when I was writing my speech, I used you see, I'm prohibited in handshakes. I use the word prohibited, and then I Googled the definition of prohibited, and get this. Um, so the Google definition that came up was forbidden and banned. And I can assure you, I'm not forbidden and banned to shake people's hands, OK? That was just my insecurity changing my whole thought process on shaking people's hands. It was my insecurities were affecting me in a way where I wasn't comfortable with it. But no, I'm not forbidden to shake people's hands with my right hand. I've never been, you're banned. Like, no. Um, so I can also, uh, in fact, with my friends, any time that I would extend with my left hand, they would literally take it as an insult. Like, they appreciated it a lot more when I was comfortable extended with my right hand, because to them, it showed them a level of trust and just like being comfortable with them. So for them to want me to shake with my right hand was really eye-opening for me to feel, you know, okay with my situation. And I didn't mind if it was a little awkward with my friends because they were cool with it, so I was cool with it. And 
There are type of typical routines that ordinary people don't really think about as um, like a privilege. You see, another daily thing we all take for granted is driving. Um, see, like people are at their angriest during times of traffic, and this is what I've noticed quickly in three months of driving. Okay, I'm, I'm no immune. I'm not immune to road rage. Okay. It's, it's annoying, I live in Long Island, it's the worst, but it's not the end of the world, okay? Um, see, like, other people, when in traffic, they don't, they fail to recognize all the other groups of people who uncontrollably cannot drive. And you'd be surprised to know how many people out there can't drive. And so for me, I look at those people and I look at me being able to drive as a privilege and I'm grateful for it. I work delivery and pizza, so it doesn't affect my job, so it's, it's a good thing. Yeah. Um, so, you know, people feel entitled when failing to recognize all the other groups. Oh yeah, I just said that. Oh. Um, I'm lucky to say that having scleroderma hasn't impacted my way in making friends, and they don't view me as a kid with an illness. They don't view me as sick. They don't view me any differently, but they view me for who I truly am. Um, sometimes, believe it or not, I actually enjoy having scleroderma because it makes you so unique so you already possess the ability to connect with strangers in a way where the ordinary person can't. Because how are they going to forget the person with scleroderma? I mean, come on. Sounds like a foreign jigsaw puzzle. Right? <laughs> um, so my advice is don't let linear scleroderma win by affecting the things we still have control over, such as school, friendships, and family. Um, and I know this is short, but I want to end off with two famous quotes that really helped me. Um, one famous quote is from a famous news sport anchor, Stuart Scott. And when accepting his SB award speech, he said, when you die, that does not mean you lose to cancer. You beat cancer by how you live the manner in which you live, and why you live. And I take this quote, and I apply it to scleroderma. Yes, I have scleroderma. That's the reality. But for me to allow scleroderma to affect things I still control, that's when I'm letting scleroderma get to the best of me. And I know that deep down, I'm bigger than scleroderma. And we're bigger than words, we're bigger than our illnesses, and it's important to know that. Um, another quote I like is, how we walk with the broken speaks louder than how we sit with the great. It doesn't take any effort to sit with the great. It takes heart, passion, bravery to walk with the broken. Um, I, can, I hope that out of today's message, you guys can realize that you should take having this illness and look at it with a little more pride because, and less confusion. Because we all start off with the generic problem. We all originally ask, why me? Why me? Why am I dealt with this, you know? As a typical question. Um, Instead, focus your attention on what's next for me. What do I still control? What can I do to improve this situation? Because I look at it like this. You start off with the diagnosis. Call it rock bottom. Call it what it is. There's only one way to go. It's up. You can only go up from rock bottom. Um, so not to say I've hit rock bottom, but I've definitely hit um, struggling times and it helps me realize that with a positive mindset, you know, anything's possible. 
So there's a saying, strength in numbers, and I firmly believe that. So that's why I decided to fly out all of you out here because hopefully it can be the start of long li uh, long lifelong friendships. Um, you know, with Snapchat, phones in today's society, it's easier nowadays to keep in touch just with a click of a button. It's that easy to keep in touch. And I think that's really cool. So to give you some background information, I started up a lasting mark with really no anticipation on how big it would become. And the amount of support I received from teachers, students, friends of friends who didn't even know me on a first name basis, like it was incredible to see. It really was um, awesome. Like, to see the power that uh, charities can have. So that's why, because of the generosity of others, that's why we're all here today. It's not because of me. It's because of the kindness of other people's hearts that were donating to the cause was why we're all here today. And so seeing the impacts that my charity has had and the power I have with it is really incredible to me. Um, so, you know, uh, me and my mom are always looking for, you know, new members of the committee. We're open to anyone. We want to raise money to further enhance scientific research on potential treatments. This is what it's about. And I hope all the kids here today by now have realized you're not alone in this. And it should be eye-opening to see that, you know, just in this room and just this room only, there are a lot of kids like us going through similar challenges. It might not be on the same scale. It might be at different times. We are, we're all on different paths. But one thing's for certain, a positive mindset. Um, going back to the first present we uh, saw uh, the quote was, the worst, di uh, the worst disability out there is a bad attitude. And I really like that because I couldn't agree more. Um, attitude is everything. We control our attitude. We can't control diagnoses. And, but attitude, the people who we surround ourselves with, that, those are all things we still have a firm grip on, so. Um, I want to give a quick shout out to my mom, who's uh, really the, I call her the Bill Belichick on the sidelines. <laughs> she really is the coordinator of all of this, and without her, none of this would be possible. So I'm top here. Yeah, uh, they call me Brady. Um, <laughs> those are my brothers. They're like the kickers, punters, you know. <laughs> but, uh, you know, everyone has a role. And everyone that I'm surrounded by, and Kathy, everyone has played a pivotal role to, my, to where I am today. And with their love and support for allowing me to be the man I am today, uh, I give all the credit to them. My mom's strong uh, sense of op uh, optimism has translated through me. So my advice to the parents out here tonight would be, you know, patience is definitely one of the biggest keys. Um, be patient with your kids. There's going to be times where they're upset. They're just as upset as you. You might get into altercations, verbal, and that's expected, you know, especially for teenagers going through this. You can't expect them to, you know, just know it, know. Uh, you can't expect them to have this sense of gratitude, and it comes with experience. It comes with maturity. It doesn't happen overnight. So patience 
is definitely key. It's uh, any diagnosis that is recent um, is very uh, overwhelming at first. And through the love and support and seeing how my mom always wanted to turn this into positive, I just couldn't agree with her more. Um, I just, yeah. Uh, and so to finally conclude, one thing that's helped me is that uh, I never look at the things I can't do. I make, a, I make a list of all the things I can do, but uh, we don't have a time, we don't have the time to discuss all that. So uh, thank you guys for uh, being patient with me and thank you. Oh, how nice. <laughs> he comes from good stock, Mary Beth. He sure does. This is for you, Luke. Thank you for your presentation today and for your inspiration to others the whole weekend. It's been amazing. Luke, I think that um, I'm going to ask all the kids in the room to come up and take a photo with you, if that's okay. So everybody up on your feet, all the kids. Luke and his family would love to have your picture. So if you follow right over to that corner, we'll do a quick photo. All right, hurry. Run, run, run. Hurry, hurry, hurry. <laughs> Do you want something else on the background? Sure. Back there? Like what? Perfect. Uh, <laughs> our logo was yes, up your there. website. How's that? Children's Colorado. Yeah. Doesn't matter. What's the website? Yeah, we're trying to get to that. Yeah, it was, um, let me see. Probably. Let's see. Let's see if we can find it. Huh? Huh? Oh, I don't see it. Well, the rest of them run out on there. Oh, okay. Wait a minute. We're trying to get a good background for you. Let's see. Uh, just a dark background? Just turn it off? Okay, we could do that. I know how to turn it off. That's a, one of my favorites. Shut down. One of my favorites. <laughs> All right, it's coming. Almost done. Shutting down. Perfect. That's better. Okay, more kids? All right, all right, all right. Come on up here. Can I have a quick picture? Look at this. This is all about all of you. Look at all those parents out there wanting to see your smiling faces. Ready? Set. Say cheese. Cheese. Come on. Big, big. All right. Oh, strike up those. Yeah, happy Halloween. Okay, so, so we got Sarah and Jesse and Brianna. Are they still here for the birthdays? Who wants to sing happy birthday to these three? All right, ready? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Sarah, Jesse, Brianna. Happy birthday to you and many more. All right. Okay, so I hope you've had a great time with us. I appreciate all of your all of you, your families, the parents. You guys are amazing. And um, hopefully you've done your evaluations. Just drop them off on your way out. Any other words, Cindy? Any other words? Drop off their evals. Oh, and pick up those presents. I don't want to take those home. <laughs> okay, thanks. Have a great night. Hope to see you soon. Just one more thing. Um, I mentioned earlier, for any of you staying over through tomorrow, our patient education day for the Rocky Mountain chapter is tomorrow at UC Health, which is the hospital just west of this hospital, there are some um, registration forms on the table outside. If you're, uh, you can make it tomorrow morning or tomorrow all day. We're, we're 
Welcome to have you. Thank you. That doesn't sound right. We welcome you. Thank you for coming and uh, safe travels home. I hope you made some good friends this trip and made some good connections to reach out to both parents and kids when, when you need the support. We loved having you here. Thank you.